see Dr. Dr. Strauss. He's currently a professor of physics at OU. Don't hold that against him. He's actually a Texan. So he was born in Fort Worth, and he's been a Cowboys fan since he was two years old. So he's not one of these bandwagon guys that jumped on since six and one. He's been a Cowboys fan for a long time. So for a lot of you, for most of you, that's probably enough credibility to bring him up. But for those of you in the room that not, might need to want a little bit more credibility, here's some other things that are going to give you some insight as to who Dr. Strauss is. Um, there's a long list, and so I picked out some of the highlights that I thought you might want to hear. He's got more degrees than a thermometer, so I picked out a couple of these things. Um, he's he's pretty, pretty educated, a lot more educated than I am. Um, but he's been married for 25 years. He has two kids. Um, he got his undergrad at Biola University, um, graduated summa cum laude. Uh, he had a grad laude. Is that right? Okay. Um, I didn't get all those degrees. So anyway, I uh, got a grad degree in physics at UCLA and a postdoc at UMass and Amherst. Um, following that up, along with some other things that he's done, he's done some research at, the, at Slack and at Fermilab, um, so some high-profile uh, research institutes. Uh, he works with Reasons to Believe, which is an organization that integrates faith and science, and currently he's researching elementary particle physics um, in CERN, which is in Geneva, Switzerland. He was there a couple of uh, a couple of weeks ago doing some of that research and, and addressing some people there. So, um, but even though he's doing all those things all over the world, all over the country, um, he's still sought after even here to, I mean, as he's being sought after to speak on this issue, he still serves locally where he's at. And so he also, not only does he does do all these things around the country, but he currently serves at Wildwood Community Church in his home church in Norman. So I wanna welcome up Dr. Strauss and turn over the, the time to him. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. It's really exciting to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, it's all, I get to travel around the country and around the world and talk about this issue of um, science and Christianity, which we're going to talk about tonight. Let's see if we can get this started. Um, but it's always good to be at a Big 12 school, you know, because OU is a Big 12 school. We get to play Texas Tech every year in sports. It's a down year for both of us in football this year, so I can, you know, commiserate with you, but it's really great to be here. Um, so tonight I want to talk about this subject of modern scientific evidence for the existence of God. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to talk about proof for the existence of God. There is no such thing as proof for God. But I want to talk about evidence that points to uh, there being a God. And you, you might think that, you know, there's nothing that science has to do with Christianity at all. But that wasn't always the case. Let's see if we can get this going. Is um, going to work? Nope. All right, let's just do it this way. Um, it used to be that some of the great scientists were also Christians. People like Isaac Newton and James Maxwell, Michael Faraday and Blaise Pascal were people who were great scientists. If you have a physics class, you've heard these names. And there were also people who believed in God, that these two realms, science and Christianity, went hand in hand. But if you look at these pictures, these are black and white photos, these are paintings, these are old people. You know, most of these guys aren't around anymore, or all these guys aren't around anymore. <laughs> and we, we live in a whole new era. We live in an era of space telescopes and super colliders and digital sky surveys. And you could ask the question, you know, is science and Christianity have anything to say about each other or to each other in today's modern world? Or is it just the old guys who are dead that thought that the two were somehow compatible? So I want to talk tonight about this question, what does science have to say about God and the place of humans in the universe? Um, sometimes you'll hear a story that tells the story of what science has to say about God and the place of humans. Um, in fact, in our astronomy class, introductory astronomy class at OU, there's a professor who tells the story something like this. And the story goes, once upon a time, humans used to think they were pretty special, that they were the center of the universe. In fact, they thought that the Earth was the center of the universe, and that made humans pretty special. And then a guy named Copernicus came along, and Copernicus showed us that we weren't the center of the universe. We were just another planet out there, and that seemed to demote the place of humans in the universe. And then Isaac Newton came along, and he said that the universe runs by these laws of nature, mechanistic laws. And if you have laws of nature that make the universe run, then you don't need a god to make the universe run. So before, when people used to attribute things to God doing them, now we didn't need that anymore. We knew that nature just ran on its own. It was like a great clock or something. 
And then Charles Darwin came along and said that humans are really nothing special. We are just the product of natural um, processes, random mutation and natural selection, and that humans have no, nothing about them at all that makes them special. And this is the story of science that is often told, that science has um, made the place of humans in the universe, minimized the place of humans in the universe, and made any need for God um, irrelevant. And the problem with the story, there's a couple problems with the story. One is that it's really a false story. And let me give you an idea for what I mean by that. Here's a picture of what the idea of the universe looked like before Copernicus. The Earth is at the center, um, pretty much. Uh, this is from Dante's Divine Comedy. And the planets orbit them. But people on the Earth used to think that there was this huge difference between the Earth, which was terrestrial, and the planets, which were celestial. The planets were these perfect objects that went in beautiful circular orbits. And they were somehow elevated above the Earth. And the closer you got to the center of the universe, actually, the worse it got. At the center of the Earth itself was hell. And that was the worst you could get. And the Earth was kind of like the garbage dump of the universe. Everything fell to the Earth because it collected the universe's garbage. And so when Copernicus came along and said, the Earth is like one of these celestial objects, the Earth is not the center of the universe, it's a planet, it actually elevated the Earth from being this low terrestrial garbage dump to being this high celestial planet. So the story was actually wrong. When Copernicus said that the Earth was a planet, that wasn't the center of the universe, it didn't demote the place of humans in the universe, it actually elevated the place of humans in the universe. Um, but the worst part about how this story is told is it's not modern science. I mean, Darwin wrote Origin of the Species 150 years ago. And what has happened since then that talks about the place of God and the place of humans? So I want to talk about some stuff that's happened since Darwin, since before some of you were born 150 years ago. All right. And I want to talk about three things from modern science. Modern scientific evidence for God. I want to talk about the origin of the universe, the design of the universe, and something called the rare earth. So let's start with the origin of the universe. Um, prior to 1929, most scientists believed that the universe had always existed, that it was eternal, it was infinite in size and infinite in time. And then um, um, Edwin Hubble came along, and he noticed that the universe was expanding. It's kind of like this raisin bread model of the universe. The raisins are galaxies, and as the raisin bread expands, all of the raisins get farther apart. And what Hubble noticed is that all the galaxies in our universe are getting farther apart. It implies that the universe is expanding. Well, if the universe is expanding, you can run the film backwards and figure out what happened backwards in time. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that it, well, I guess Hubble was a rocket scientist, but you don't, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that at one point the universe was, had a beginning, was very small and very dense because it's been expanding. And so when Hubble realized that the universe was expanding, it implied that the universe must have an origin sometime when this expansion started. And scientists didn't like that idea, the idea that the universe had an origin. Shortly after Hubble made his observation, um, Arthur Eddington said this, philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order of nature is repugnant. I should like to find a genuine loophole. Well, why is it repugnant? It's repugnant because if you have a beginning of the universe, it opens up the idea that you might have a beginner. And it was the fact that the universe might have had a beginner that was repugnant to Arthur Eddington. And so scientists were very reluctant to accept this model of the universe that it had a beginning, what we now call the Big Bang, um, because of the philosophical and theological implications. But the observational evidence was so strong, the scientists eventually um, came to believe this is the model of how the universe began. So what are the observations that changed scientists' mind from this philosophical bias against the Big Bang to believing it? And there were basically three. The first is that the universe is expanding. We mentioned that, and I'll talk about it a little bit more. The second is the temperature of the universe, and I'll talk a little bit more about these. And the third is the elements in the universe. And I want to just describe these briefly because these are huge, powerful evidences that cause scientists to change their mind from not accepting a Big Bang origin to accepting this Big Bang origin in the universe. And the first is the expansion of the universe. Um, this is a picture taken from what's called the Hubble um, Deep Field Telescope. 
What they did is they took the Hubble telescope in outer space and they pointed it to a place in the sky where they thought there was nothing there. And they looked at a very small part of that sky. It would be like holding your um, hand at arm length and looking through a pinhole at the end of your hand at a point in the sky where you think there's nothing there. And this is what they saw. Every one of these dots except one or two are galaxies. In this point in the sky where we thought there was nothing, there are these multitudes of galaxies. And some of these galaxies form shortly after the Big Bang, only about one billion years after the Big Bang. And what you see in these pictures is just what Hubble saw. The farther away, the more the galaxies are moving away from us. It's just like what you would expect if the universe is expanding, and clearly the universe is expanding. And so that points to the universe have a beginning. The second piece of evidence that pointed to the universe having a beginning is the temperature of the universe. Um, so at once we think that the early universe was very dense, the space and time, or the space and matter of the universe was very dense and very hot. It would be much like turning on your oven and getting it very hot inside the oven. And then if you were to turn the oven off and let the heat dissipate throughout the room, eventually the room would be a little warmer because the oven was at one time very hot. So if the universe was at one time very hot, then we should see this residual heat. The universe has expanded and cooled, but we should still see some of the heat left over, just like you'd see some of the heat left over from the oven. So in 1964, um, two Bell um, lab scientists observed this heat left over from the Big Bang. We call it the cosmic background microwave radiation. It was exactly what's expected um, if it's this heat left over from the Big Bang. Now, this background radiation should serve as a blueprint for what the, big, what the universe looked like um, when it was basically formed, shortly after it was formed. So what would you expect if you could look at a blueprint of what the universe will look like even before it, was, it actually looked like that, like looking at the blueprint of a house? Well, you would expect it to be mostly uniform. So what do I mean by that? Everywhere you look in the universe, it looks more or less the same, but not completely uniform because there are some stars and planets and galaxies. So you expect it to be almost the same, but not quite the same. And that's exactly what you see when you look at the temperature of the universe. The latest measurements of the cosmic background radiation have been made by the Planck satellite. And what you see in this picture is an, this oval is kind of an unfolding of the whole, whole sky. It's looking at the whole sky of the universe. And the points that are a little bit um, brighter are slightly warmer, and the points that are a little bit darker are slightly cooler. And the difference is one part in 10,000. It's, it's, it means it's almost exactly the same temperature, but it's not quite exactly the same temperature. And in fact, the cooler points serve eventually as seeds for galaxy cluster formation. So this is exactly what you would expect to see as far as the temperature of the universe if it started with a Big Bang. And then finally, the third piece of evidence that convinced scientists of the truth of the Big Bang is what's called the light elements of the universe. That is um, about the amount of hydrogen and helium that's in the universe. And the Big Bang predicts the universe should have about 73% hydrogen, about 26% helium. Th those were the elements formed in the first few minutes of the Big Bang. Nothing else was formed, none of the carbon in our bodies or silicon or iron, just those first few elements. But what we see is exactly in agreement with what is predicted to about one part in 10,000. And so these observational evidences convince scientists that the universe, the origin of the universe is what we call um, the hot Big Bang. Now in retrospect, we probably should have known this already. Albert Einstein in the early 20th century developed something called the general theory of relativity. And the general theory of relativity describes how gravity works. And in his theories, um, the general theory of relativity predicted that space should be expanding in the equations themselves. But Einstein didn't like that because he knew that if space is expanding, it might imply it had an origin. And so he added a fudge factor to his equation, something called the cosmological constant. So that even though it wasn't part of his equations, um, he put it there just to avoid the expansion of the universe. And when Hubble observed the universe was expanding, Einstein said that was the worst mistake of his um, professional career, was putting that constant that shouldn't have been there. He should have predicted that the universe was expanding. Well, in the 1970s, um, three scientists, um, Roger Penrose, George Ellis, and Stephen Hawking, took Einstein's general theory of relativity, and they applied it not only to space that was expanding, 
but to time that was expanding as well. And what they showed is that the general theory of relativity predicted that this universe actually had a beginning, that everything in this universe, space, time, matter, and energy, had a beginning at the Big Bang. So the Big Bang is really a misnomer. The Big Bang sounds like something's exploding, but a better explanation is really the origin of the universe. There's nothing there to explode. There's nothing there to bang. It's the beginning of everything you know of space, time, matter, and energy. And that creates some philosophical and theological problems. Um, when the evidence for the Big Bang was so overwhelming, Paul Gribben wrote in a book, the biggest problem with the Big Bang theory of the origin of the universe is philosophical, perhaps even theological. What was there before the bang? And here's the point. If the universe had an origin, then whatever caused this universe can't be part of this universe. It's got to be something we call transcendent, not a physical part of this universe. Right? If this universe had an origin, then whatever started it can't be a part of this universe. It has to be transcendent. And that has extreme theological implications. Robert Jastrow wrote this, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> So what he's saying is that science has stumbled upon what the Bible actually, what the theologians knew all along. First, that the universe had a beginning. The very first verse of the Bible declares that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It wasn't until the 1970s that we knew that the universe really had a beginning. Um, that the stuff of this universe did not exist at one time. The writer to the Hebrews says, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. What we see now didn't come from something else that we could see. And that's what we now know is true about this universe. And then finally, that whatever, whoever started this universe, he's not bound by space and time, he's transcendent. And Paul wrote that God acted before the beginning of time. Grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. It's interesting that the New Testament is the whole, only holy book in the entire world um, out of all the holy books that people revere, it's the only holy book in the world that explicitly mentions God acting before time began. And it wasn't until the late 1970s that we even had an inkling that time might have had a beginning. But 2,000 years ago, this author wrote that time did have a beginning and that God actually acted before time had its beginning. So that's the origin of the universe. The second piece of evidence for modern science for the existence of God is the design in the universe. Um, the definitive book on this was written in 1986. It's called The Anthropic Cosmological Principle. Anthropic comes from the Greek word anthropos, which means mankind. So the anthropic principle basically states that there are many of the parameters of the universe that are particularly fine-tuned so that humans can exist. It's as if you have some kind of control panel with a few hundred knobs on the control panel, and you have to put all the knobs in just the right place to create a universe that can support humans. And if you switch any knobs just a little bit, then the universe is inhospitable to life. And in their book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle, um, Barrow and Tipler, a physicist and a cosmologist, list about 100 of these different parameters. And I just want to mention a few. Um, we don't want to be here till midnight to mention all 100, so I'll talk about a few. Uh, first is the amount of matter in the universe. So as the universe is expanding, um, everything in the universe is attracted to everything else by gravity. And so if the universe doesn't have enough, if the universe has too much stuff in it, it starts to expand, but everything is so attracted to everything else that it collapses really quick, like a strong rubber band or something. So if there's too much stuff in the universe, the universe collapses quickly. If there's too little stuff in the universe, the universe expands so quickly that there's not enough stuff to form galaxies and stars, and you can't have a universe that supports life. And shortly after the Big Bang, within a second or so after the Big Bang, the amount of stuff in the universe was fine-tuned to one part in 10 to the 60th. A phenomenal number. It means if you had changed the amount of stuff in the universe by just one part in 10 to the 60th, at that point in time, you would not have a universe that could support life. And this is a remarkable thing. Paul Davies writes about this. To choose rho, that's the Greek letter rho, it means the amount of matter in the universe, so close to the critical amount, 
fine-tuned to such stunning accuracy, is surely one of the great mysteries of cosmology. If the crucial ratio had been 10 to the minus 57th, rather than less than 10 to the minus 60th, the universe would not even exist, having collapsed to oblivion after just a few million years. Now, since Davies wrote that, we've learned more about this matter fine-tuning, and we think we understand how it occurs. There's this process called cosmic inflation, which seems to force the matter density of the universe to be exactly what it wants. It's a mechanism that causes the universe to spit out what you need to have life. It's again as if it's fine-tuned or, or designed to create life in the universe. And we understand a lot more about this fine-tuning. We now think we even understand how it's accomplished through this mechanism of something called cosmic inflation. Um, another one of the parameters in the universe that's fine-tuned is the strength of the strong nuclear force. All right? So I'm a physicist. Here's your physics lesson for tonight. Um, everything in the universe is composed of atoms. You should know that or you shouldn't be at Texas Tech. All right? <laughs> and every atom has a nucleus in the middle of it. And every nucleus is made of neutrons and protons. And every neutron and proton is made of quarks. Um, does anybody know what quarks are made of? Uh, no, we really don't. If you knew, we could win a Nobel Prize because nobody knows what quarks are made of. Right? So there's speculation about what quarks are made of, but nobody knows. But anyway, it's the strong nuclear force that binds the quarks together in the nucleus and eventually binds the nucleus together. It's because of the strength of the strong nuclear force that we have the periodic table. If you were to make the strong nuclear force just 2% stronger, it would take hydrogen, the first one up there, out of the periodic table. So if I take this knob for the strong nuclear force and I tweak it 2% stronger, I basically have no hydrogen. Well, that creates an extreme problem for life, right? Because water is H2O. It consists of hydrogen. You wouldn't have water. Stars burn hydrogen. In fact, the only kind of stars that can support life like us have to burn hydrogen. That hydrogen would not be around to burn. So you can't tweak the strong nuclear force 2% stronger. If you tweak the strong nuclear force 5% weaker, then this is what the periodic table looks like. You just have hydrogen. Okay? Now, that would make chemistry class really easy. right? <laughs> you go to chemistry class, study hydrogen. But it would be really bad for the universe. All right? So the strong nuclear force is just the right amount it needs to be for life to exist. Another one of these parameters is how carbon is formed. Everything in the universe that's, you know, life is based on carbon. The DNA your body are long carbon chains. Life is based on carbon. Well, where does the carbon in your body come from? Um, it actually comes from stars that have died. Every star has a life cycle, like everything in the universe. They're born, they live for a while, they die. And the last stage in a star's life is it creates carbon. And the carbon that's in your body came, was created, by a, a star dying. And as the star dies and creates carbon, the carbon is formed through this process of what are called nuclear resonance states. It's an extremely complex process. Um, when I was young and naive, I used to try to explain the process, but I don't even try to explain it anymore. Instead, I just give you an analogy. All right? Creating carbon in stars is like a Rube Goldberg machine. Um, here's a Goldberg machine where you fly the kite out the window, and that pulls a string that opens the cage and moths fly out of the cage and eat the coat, and that makes the coat lighter weight, so the shoe drops on the switch, which starts the iron up, and the iron burns the squirrel that runs up the tree and jumps into the basket, and then the basket raises the other cage and the bird sharpens the pencil. All right? So this is a pencil sharpener. <laughs> but the remarkable, the remarkable thing about a Rube Goldberg machine is if you break down the process anywhere along the way, the whole thing breaks down. And this is what the formation of carbon is like as stars die. Owen Ginrich, an astronomer, wrote this. Had the resonance level in the carbon been 4% higher, there would be essentially no carbon. Had that level in the oxygen been only a half a percent higher, virtually all the carbon would have been converted to oxygen. Without that carbon abundance, neither you nor I would be here tonight. So here we got all these nuclear resonance. Again, you can think of the knobs. You twist the nuclear resonance by 2% or 4% or something and you don't have carbon and you don't have life. There's been a lot of research since Gingrich wrote that about how this process of carbon formation occurs. And just a couple years ago, a North Carolina state um, astronomer and some of his colleagues, or physicists actually, um, published a paper that talked about how this carbon is formed. So this is current research. And what he showed is that the quarks that make up the neutron and proton, 
what are called light quarks or up and down quarks, that their mass is finely tuned to allow these resonance to exist to allow carbon to be made. And he writes this, we find that more than a two or three percent change in the light quark mass, that's the mass of up and down quarks, would lead to problems with the abundance of either carbon or oxygen in the universe. So that's the ultimate reason that you and I exist because the up and down quarks are fine-tuned their mass to one part or to two or three percent. And if you change that, there's no carbon, there's no us and other things. So there's lots of evidence for design in the universe. I've listed just three things, the amount of matter in the universe, the strong nuclear force, and the formation of carbon. There's a hundred or so similarly fine-tuned parameters. And you can ask, well, what do scientists who study this say about this fine-tuning? So I'll, I'll quote a few. Frederick Hoyle says, such properties seem to run through the fabric of the natural world like a happy thread of coincidences. But there are so many odd coincidences essential to life that some explanation seems required to account for them. In their book, Cosmic Coincidences, John Gribben and Martin Rees write, if we modify the value of one of the fundamental constants, something invariably goes wrong, leading to a universe that is inhospitable to life as we know it. When we adjust a second constant in an attempt to fix the problems, the result generally is to create three new problems for every one that we solve. The conditions in our universe really do seem to be uniquely suitable for life forms like ourselves, and perhaps even for any form of organic complexity. And then finally, Paul Davies, who is another physicist who studied this, says, there's for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though someone has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. By the way, these people that I'm quoting, because I will quote physicists who have studied this a lot, and these, none of these people are, are theists. None of them believe in God. They're all atheists or agnostics, so, but they see the same principles. They see the fine-tuning. They see the impression of design, but they come to different conclusions, and we'll talk about some of those conclusions as we go on tonight. But you should know that these are not theists who are writing to support my point. Quite the opposite, they're atheists and agnostic who would not always agree with my points. All right. So the third thing I want to talk about is what's called the rare earth. Now, if you watch science fiction like I do, you're very aware um, that there are many planets like the earth scattered throughout the universe. And they're called, in Star Trek, they're called M-class planets, of course. And on every planet, you know, there are beings that are kind of like us, except they have green skin or re weird forehead ridges or something, right? or hair that looks like it just came out of the washer. You know, so they have something that looks different, but other than that, they're just like us. But you can ask the question, you know, is it really probable to find a planet like the Earth? So what would be necessary? Well, the first thing is you have to live in the right kind of galaxy. We live in what's called a spiral galaxy. It means that the stars in the galaxy are arranged in these spiral patterns. What you see is what our galaxy would look like if you could get far enough away from it. And these spiral patterns you see are, are hundreds of billions of stars. And most galaxies in the universe are irregular galaxies or elliptical galaxies. Only about 5 or 10% are spiral galaxies. But irregular galaxies and elliptical galaxies um, have too much naturally occurring radioactivity and, and poor star formation to allow for higher life forms to exist. And I should define higher life forms because I'm going to use that term a lot tonight. Um, what I mean by higher life forms is any life form more complex than bacteria. All right? So the ants crawling around in your house are higher life forms. Bacteria is not. Bacteria can pretty much survive anywhere. But if you want to have something more complex than bacteria, um, then you need something more uh, habitable. And that's what we're going to talk about. I once gave this talk and a biologist came up to me and said, I think bacteria are pretty complex. But we're going to ignore bacteria for tonight. All right? <laughs> So you not only have to live in a spiral galaxy, you have to live in the right place of the galaxy. From about one-third out of the galaxy to two-thirds out is called the galactic habitable zone. If you're too close to the center of the galaxy, you've got too much star formation and you have too much radiation to support higher life forms. In fact, at the very center of our galaxy is a black hole, which is a really bad place for life to exist. Um, and then if you're too far from the center of the galaxy, there's not enough um, heavy elements that have been formed from star dying to create planets like ours. So you have to be in what's called the galactic habitable zone. And of course, our sun is right in the middle of this galactic habitable zone. 
You've got to be orbiting the right kind of star. Our sun is a class G star. It's the only kind of star that will burn um, stably and long enough to have a planet like the Earth form around it. Um, so the planet, the star has to be of sufficient mass, it's got to be of sufficient age, it's got to be a class um, G star. It has to be what's called a bachelor star. Many stars are stars that orbit another star, they're called binary stars. But such stars can't support stable um, circular orbits or near circular orbits around them. And so you have to have a bachelor star. <coughs> you also have to have what's called a third generation star, which is what our sun is. Um, the first generation stars were all hydrogen and helium, and they didn't last very long because that's all that was formed at the Big Bang. They burned out, they died, and they created some heavy elements, some elements like carbon and iron and nickel and silicon, but not enough to create planets like the Earth and Venus that are rocky. So you had to have a second generation of stars form, and some of those die to create enough elements for a planet like the Earth that have enough elements. So you need at least a third generation star for the Earth to form. And our sun is a third generation star. Um, if you ever read Carl Sagan, the great um, astrophysicist, or watch the movie uh, Contact, in that movie, Carl Sagan brings up an, a very important question. And his question is, is there other life in the universe? Well, I certainly don't know the answer, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Um, and he says the universe is so big that there must be other life in the universe. And he, he marvels at the huge size of the universe. But Carl Sagan isn't really thinking very clearly when he asks that question. Because here's what goes on. Think about it. As the universe gets older, it grows bigger. So the size of the universe is correlated with the age of the universe. It started small in a Big Bang. As it gets older, it grows bigger. Now, suppose you wanted to start with a Big Bang and create one planet like the Earth. That was your goal, to create one planet where humans could exist. Well, you have to wait for three generations of stars. And the third generation of stars don't form until about 10 billion years after the Big Bang, when our star formed, our sun. And so, if you want to create a planet like the Earth, you've got to let the universe expand for 10 billion years. And in that time, it gets to a big size. The universe is now about 14 billion years old because our sun's about four and a half billion. And so, if you want to create a planet like the Earth, this is the shortest amount of time it takes from the Big Bang for us to create our sun and our Earth because it takes three generations of stars. So if this is the short, shortest amount of time since the Big Bang that you could create one planet like the Earth, this is also the smallest universe you could have and create one planet like the Earth. So as huge as this universe is, it's the smallest you could have and the youngest you could have and have one planet like the Earth um, in the universe. It's as if as soon as the universe can birth a planet like ours, it does, and as soon as it can birth people like us, it does. It's like it was made for us almost. And so the question isn't why isn't the universe so big, the question is why is the universe so small? Why is it that as soon as we could get life in a planet like this, it appears at the youngest, smallest possible time in the history of the universe? So we also live on an amazing planet. The Earth is unlike any other planet we know. There are so many factors in the Earth that make it suitable for life forms like ourselves. Um, if you change the Earth distance from the Sun by as little as 2%, it would disrupt the water cycle. If you change the rotation rate of the Earth by a few percent, it would create conditions that would make it hard for life to exist. If you change its size by a little bit. Um, it's even been shown that tectonic activity is necessary for higher life forms to exist on a planet. I used to live in California for much of my life. We we're very aware of tectonic activity in California. But, you know, we don't really like it very much there, although we build for it. But scientists have shown that without tectonic activity, you could not have um, higher life forms existing on, on the planet. The, the ratio of water to land, there, there's literally a few hundred things that have to do with the Earth. Our single large moon is very important. No other planet we know has a single large moon, but the single large moon stabilizes the tilt of the Earth's axis. And if that tilt wasn't stable, it would disrupt life. The, uh, Jupiter is a huge planet. It's got this um, great gravitational field, and it, it it orbits in a nearly circular orbit, but it's so big with such a large gravitational field that Jupiter kind of acts like a vacuum cleaner. It sucks up comets and asteroids that would be headed for us that could hit the Earth 
and destroy life. So we live in a, a solar system that seems fine-tuned. And the more you look at the planet Earth, the more it becomes apparently a rare place. And in fact, Peter Ward and Donald Brownlee from the University of Washington wrote a book a few, well now 14 years ago, called Rare Earth, and that was exactly their thesis. They say if some godlike being could be given the opportunity to, to plan a sequence of events with the express purpose of duplicating our Garden of Eden, by that they mean the Earth, that power would face a formidable task. It is unlikely that Earth could ever, true, ever be truly duplicated. So this is what's called the rare Earth hypothesis. And again, when scientists look at these kinds of factors, they marvel, they write statements like Fred Hoyle writes, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. And Alan Sandage, who I'll talk about a little bit later, writes, I find it quite improbable that such order came out of chaos. There has to be some organizing principle. God to me is a mystery, but is the explanation for the miracle of existence, why there is something instead of nothing. Now, scientists have asked this question like this um, for a long time now, once we started to understand this anthropic principle. How could such a probable universe exist? And I want to tell you the conclusion of the two premier scientists that really wrote the definitive book on this, John Barrow and Frank Tipler. So Barrow and Tipler believe the universe is so well designed that there must actually be a designer. But they don't believe in God. And so God's not the designer. They there, then in their book, they go through a long process of explaining why they believe humans are the only intelligent life in the universe. And I won't go through their arguments, but they go through a lot of scientific arguments to explain why they think humans are the only intelligent life. So here's their problem. They say the universe requires an intelligent designer to create it, but there is no God, and humans are the only intelligence in the universe. So then who creates the universe? Do you see the problem? Okay. So here's their answer. Baron Tipler, who are two well-respected scientists, think that humans will continue to evolve, and someday they will become almost like gods, and humans will reach back in time and create the universe for themselves. Okay, that's their answer. Right? So here, here's my picture of what that looks like. <laughs> So why would a well-respected physicist and cosmologist come to such a conclusion? Because the evidence for design is overwhelming. The evidence for design is so overwhelming, and they don't believe in God, that this becomes their most next logical conclusion, that the universe is created by humans by reaching back in time and creating it for themselves. But there are other options. The most frequently quoted option is that there is a near infinite number of universes or multiverse. Maybe string theory says 10 to the 500. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, and if there happens to be a bill, you know, millions and millions and billions and billions of universes, then one, not galaxies, universes, things we'll never know about, other universes, then we happen to live in the right one. And that's a possibility. That's what some people believe. Another option is that there really is a transcendent intelligent designer and creator. And which of these options seem most probable? Right? That humans create the universe for themselves, that there's an infinite number, or that there is a God. Those are really the options. Um, so let me kind of just review what I've said so far. Here's what I've said that modern science says about God. First, the universe had a Big Bang origin. And this implies that the universe had a transcendent origin that the cause is not a part of this universe. Then I talked about the anthropic principle. That says that the universe appears to be designed for humans. And I've written kind of the dates of when these ideas were first developed. Research still goes on on all these ideas today. And then I talked about the rare earth hypothesis, that the habitable earth seems rare if not unique. And if you're like me, a scientist, you, you keep saying, well, is there any more scientific findings regarding this that has anything new been developed. You know, because these ideas, some of them started 80 years ago. Some of them are old by now. And the, the answer is yes. People continue to write about this subject and talk about it. 
Two books that have come out in the last four years are Stephen Hawking's The Grand Design and Lawrence Krauss' The Universe from Nothing. And they talk about these ideas. And so to give you kind of an update of what the latest thinking is on these ideas, I want to talk a little bit about Stephen Hawking's book, The Grand Design. So I read this book, and when I read it, I noticed that in the first chapter, he posed three questions. The questions were, why is there something rather than nothing? Why do we exist? And why this particular set of laws and not some other? And when I saw those three questions, I thought to myself, that's interesting because those are exactly the three questions that I've been talking about in my talks about scientific evidence for God. Why is there something rather than nothing has to do with the origin of the universe. Why do we exist, at least partially, because of the rare earth that we live on? And why this particular set of laws and not some other? And that's exactly what the anthropic principle is all about. So when I read his book, it occurred to me that the authors felt compelled to write a book addressing these issues, and it shows that these I issues, this evidence for God, um, from scientific discoveries is still relevant, prevalent, and compelling. They were so compelled by these arguments that people like myself have been making for 20 years that they had to try to rebut these arguments. They had to write a book to discuss them. So what I want to do is I want to go through Stephen Hawking's latest ideas about these three questions and what he thinks are the solutions without God to these three questions. So let's talk about the rare earth first. What does he say? Well, his proposal is kind of what I said before, that there are lots of planets, so one must be suitable for life. And Hawking is right. There are lots of planets. We've had found over 1,000 extrasolar planets. The Kepler telescope has found a few thousand more. And so he's right that there are lots of planets. But the real question is not, are there lots of planets? This is really poor science, because the real question is, are there lots of Earth-like planets? And what conditions are necessary for life to exist? So let me just give you a heads up. When you read the newspaper and it says scientists have found an Earth-like planet, which you will read a lot, that actually means one of three things. It doesn't mean what you think of when you think of an Earth-like planet. When you think of an Earth-like planet, you think of one like on Star Trek that we could beam down and walk around and talk to the aliens, right? But when scientists say they found an Earth-like planet, it means one of three things. It means either the planet is rocky and not made of gas. Well, Mercury is rocky, you wouldn't call it Earth-like. Or it means it's about the same size as Earth. Well, Mar Venus is about the same size as Earth. You wouldn't call it Earth-like. Or it means that the planet is in the right place in its orbit that it might have liquid water. Well, Europa might have liquid water, and you wouldn't call that Earth-like. So, but when you read they found an Earth-like planet, that's what it means. It's either the size of Earth, it's rocky, or it has maybe liquid water on it. But the real question is, what does it really take to make a planet that higher life forms could live on? And we've talked about some of the necessary things. You have to live in a spiral galaxy. That's a 10% probability. The star has to be the right distance from the galactic center. That's a 20% probability. We know these. These are hard numbers. The star has to be the right mass and the right age. Those are 0.1% probabilities and 40% probabilities. Um, and so you can kind of do what we call in science a back-of-the-envelope calculation. It's not a perfect number, but it's a guess as to how probable it is to find a planet like the Earth. Stephen Hawking doesn't do this in his book, but he should have. If he's going to say that there's lots of planets, so one might be like the Earth, he should at least get out a pencil and pen and work out just a quick guess as to how likely it is to find a planet like Earth, because here's some numbers. Well, there's more things than this that we know it takes to make a planet like Earth. Here's the complete list. All right. um, these are all things you can look up in the literature. There are actually 322 parameters the probability of finding them all in a single planet, even with what we call correlations, is 10 to, one part in 10 to the 304th. Of course, there are lots of planets. There are at least 10 to the 22 planets in our universe. We know that. So we've only found a few thousand, but there are a whole lot. So the probability of finding one Earth-like planet by chance is about one part in 10 to the 282. So we have a technical scientific term for a number that small. Um, we say it's not going to happen. That's the technical <laughs> scientific term. So it kind of bothers me that Stephen Hawking, we, in science we call it hand-waving. You don't really make a good argument. You just kind of wave your hand and say, oh, I made an argument. He says there are lots of planets, so one must be like Earth. But it doesn't take much work to realize there are lots of planets. That still doesn't mean that one has to be like Earth. So what's his answer to the anthropic principle? It's well along the same lines. 
He says that M theory or string theory proposes that there might be 10 to the 500 universes. So if there's so many universes, we must live in one. There must be one that can support life. Well, again, this is not really good science, and let me give you a few reasons. First of all, there's no evidence that M theory is actually true. There may never be. So a belief in M theory is not science. It's philosophically based on naturalism. Um, I'd love to find M theory. I'd win a Nobel Prize for it. So I'm not against it. I'm just saying don't put all your eggs in the basket of M theory when it hasn't even had a shred of evidence yet. But even if it's shown to be true, we don't really know what the implications would be, whether there'd really be 10 to the 500 universes until we test the theory. Uh, one example for this, if any of you are scientists, us, you know, um, there's a theory called quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics has an interpretation, which is a multiple universe interpretation, because it has the option of creating other universes. But no scientist actually believes, or almost no scientist actually believes, that those universes are actually created in quantum mechanics. So even if M theory is right, it doesn't necessarily mean that the universes are created. And there are a whole bunch of other problems. And so really M theory is not a um, scientifically based theory. There's no observational evidence for it. And it really predicts nothing. In fact, John Horgan understands this. He wrote, M, theorists, M theory, theorists now realize, comes in an almost infinite number of versions, which predict an almost infinite number of possible universes. And of course, a theory that predicts everything really doesn't predict anything. And that's the problem. I read this book, and you know, I was really, I was really excited when I picked up this book because I thought Hawking is such a brilliant guy, is going to give me some good answers to these questions. But he didn't. And I, I ended up writing this. It's unfortunate that a scientist of Hawking's caliber would call M theory science and invoke some of its possible predictions as evidence for or against anything because real science is based on experimental results, not just on speculation and conjecture and your philosophical bias, really. Um, so what's his answer to the origin of the universe? Remember, this is the, one of the most brilliant people in the world who's trying to answer these questions that I've posed, and here's his best answers. So his, his, his answer to the origin of the universe is something called um, the no boundary condition. He first um, introduced it in his book, A Brief History of Time. It's that the universe may not have a real beginning. It's got lots of problems. Again, um, it requires the laws of physics to operate, so where'd they come from? I would argue, and I've talked to other scientists about this, that the no boundary condition still requires an origin, still requires a beginning, even though Hawking said it doesn't. Again, like M theory, there's no basis for it, there's no evidence for it. And, and the most important thing, though, is science is based on observation, and it's the observations that led us to the conclusion that the universe had a beginning. Remember, scientists themselves were reluctant to accept the Big Bang. It was only because the observational evidence was so strong that the universe started in a Big Bang that we finally accepted it. And so the real evidence points to a real beginning. But the, the worst thing about this whole book was that um, in a logic class, a science class, a philosophy class, or a religion class, the book would get a failing grade. And this was really disappointing for me. I'll give you one example of this. Um, the question is posed in the book, are there any exceptions to the laws of physics? In other words, are there miracles? And this is Hawking's answer. The modern scientist's answer is a scientific law is not a scientific law if it holds only when some supernatural being decides not to intervene. In other words, miracles don't happen because that's not science. Well, if you've ever had a class in logic, this is a classic example of a fallacy called begging the question. And if you were a logic professor reading a paper that used that as the answer, you'd give the paper an F. It's begging the question. It's not an answer to the question. And I read this book and thinking, this is the smartest person almost on the planet who's going to answer these questions. And there was nothing of value in the book. In fact, I wasn't the only one that got that. Dwight Garner in New York Times wrote about the book, the real news about the grand design is how disappointingly tinny and inelegant it is. Okay? So how strong then is the scientific evidence for God? Well, those who best understand the evidence but choose not to believe in God instead postulate ideas like humans evolve to God-like beings who reach back in time and create the universe for themselves. Right? Or the laws of physics must precede this universe and include M theory, which can predict anything and cause the creation of 10 to 500 or more universes despite the lack of any confirming experimental evidence. Right? These, are your, these are your best options. 
Universes creates the universe from the, humans create the universe for themselves. M theory is true and or there is a God. Um, and even if M theory is true, it doesn't necessarily make these predictions. I think that's important to understand. So these ideas aren't based on scientific observation. They're inelegant, naturalistic leaps of blind faith in order to avoid the conclusion that there is a God. This is how strong the scientific evidence is for God. If you don't believe that it points to God, you come up with these ideas as the best possible alternatives. So then you can ask, well, what if the universe is designed? So what? And Paul Davies wrote a great quote on this idea. He said, if physics is the product of design, the universe must have a purpose. And the evidence of modern physics suggests strongly to me that the purpose includes us. So here's an agnostic scientist who looks at the universe and says, if physics is the product of design, then the evidence of physics suggests that the purpose of the universe includes us. And I find it interesting that then Hoyle's super intellect, he called it the super intellect, or Davies' purpose that includes us, perfectly describes the God of the Bible. David, about 2,700 years, marveled at the same thing. He said, wrote, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? How is it that the universe has a purpose for us? And Zephaniah the prophet wrote, God will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He'll rejoice over you. That there is a purpose for humans in this universe. Now there are some scientists who have seen this kind of evidence and it has caused them to believe in God. Alan Sandage was an atheistic scientist, astronomer, who looked at this evidence and eventually became a Christian based on this kind of evidence. And he writes, it was my science that drove me to the conclusion that the world is much more complicated than science. It is only through the supernatural that I can understand the mystery of existence. And George Greenstein looked at this kind of evidence and wrote, as we survey all the evidence, the thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency, or rather agency with a capital A, must be involved. Is it possible that suddenly, without intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof of the existence of a supreme being. Now, Greenstein goes farther than I did. At the beginning, I said you can't prove God, even though he uses the word proof. But I say you look at the evidence. Um, if you were in a, on a jury, you'd look at the evidence and you say, where does the evidence point? And what I believe is that when you look at all the evidence, the discoveries of modern science give evidence for the existence of a transcendent, intelligent designer who created the universe and has a purpose for for humanity. And this is really the best and most logical conclusion by looking at what we've learned from observing the universe over the last hundred years or so. All right, so we're going to have a brief break. Uh, Jeremy's going to come back up and make an announcement or two, and then I'm going to open it up to take your questions. I'm sure there's no questions from this simple talk, but uh, in case there are, we'll answer them, all right? <laughs>